Welcome to Field Sports Britain. It's a departure from our usual format. We're devoting the entire programme to one of our favourite subjects, gun dogs. Come on. In his time, Chris Burns has been the gun dog training expert for Shooting Times and Sporting Shooter magazines. He runs Breeze Leaf Kennels in the south of England, and this morning, Chris has invited Sporting Shooter editor James Marchington to one of his regular shoots at Penshurst Place in Kent to show him just what top-notch gun dogs can do and offer a few tips on how to get them this well-trained. He will be showing off his young Springer Spaniels and a Cocker. These dogs are ideal for the terrain we'll be launching into. These Spaniels just love getting stuck into dense cover. You're looking forward to today? Yes, we're here to pick up today. This is actually a beater's day, it's the end of the season. And our job basically will be to pick up any birds which have been shot. Ideally, we're going to go for the runners first, mm -hmm. um, because they're the birds which need to be put in the bag. Then we're going to sweep through afterwards picking up any dead birds. Um, some of the beaters will obviously pick up. They've also got dogs as well. But our job really is just to pick up anything which we think is going to escape and not going to be put in the bag. So which dogs are we using? This one is called Brooke. He's a three-year-old. And in the cage we've got Jazz, a four-year-old Springer Spaniel, Cedar, who's a four-year-old Springer Spaniel, and Drake, one of the Cocker Spaniels. Right. And you've, you've bred all those yourself? Yes, they're all bred by me. Um, over a period of time and we've got a very nice line going, good picking up dogs um, which are in tune with us, which want to work, enjoy working and uh, are very active. Right, they're, they're good all-rounders Spaniels basically. Yeah, very good all-rounders, yeah. I mean they're a jack of all trades, um, they're quite equally suited to the beating line and all these dogs have been in the beating line at some point and now have progressed on to picking up. And the, the guns have left a few for the beaters, have they? Yes, the guns have been very good. Left a lot for the beaters. Um, it will be cocks only, um, right? But they like to catch up the, the hen birds here. Um, so yes, we're in for a good day's sport. The same team as was yesterday. With breakfast and the briefing over with, Chris and James head off for the first drive. The dogs are clearly eager to get on with the job, and they should be kept pretty busy as we're expecting a lot of partridge from this part of the estate. The dogs will be covering a big area in front of the river. Not difficult terrain, but birds can still easily get lost here. We're going to be flanking in from the right hand side there into the wood, and then they're going to push the gun, push the birds over the guns which are staying in the field, and our plan is to basically be behind the guns. There's not an awful lot of picking up to do in, uh, out here really because most of the birds will fall the other side of the river. Any which are winged this side, we're then going to have to pick up. As soon as Chris finds a good vantage point well behind the guns, he settles down and so do his dogs. With the leads on, they're kept calm and focused. Such young dogs could end up chasing anything that grabs their attention. Chris wants selective retrieving, which he controls. If they're just allowed to free rein and run around, a, it puts off the guns which are shooting, which is basically bad etiquette, um, and B, they then become a little bit more wild. So they want these dogs are here to be selective retrieving, ones I ask them to retrieve. I can mark the birds down, the dogs can have a look, see what's going on, settle themselves down, ready for the shoot. A lot of picking up is about just sitting and waiting, isn't it? If you cannot get your dog to sit still for 20 minutes in your back garden, over in the field, on the park. It sounds a big ask, but here we're waiting for the drive to commence. We could be waiting here 30 minutes, maybe more. I'd expect my dogs to be nice and quiet. I'd expect them to be waiting patiently, still keeping, it, still keeping their senses about them, looking around just in case something comes over so they can mark it. Nice, relaxed dogs. And that all comes, again, from basic training, getting the dog to chill out, making it sit for long periods of time. One of the good exercises we do is sit the dog up, throw lots of dummies around it, so it knows that not everything's for the dog to pick up. And that's a very important point when you're picking up. Do not send your dog for every single retrieve. 
It's a big mistake. Choose the ones you want, the difficult ones. If it's laying out in the open, go and pick it up yourself. Let the dog see that you're capable of doing that. And again, that will earn a lot more respect from the dog. He knows in, yeah, OK, I can sit here, that one's not for me. Because quite often a bird will land forward of you in the open. It might be flapping around, just, just basically dying. Wrong to send your dog straight for that one. If it's there, it's dead, you go and pick it up. Yeah. Let the dog work on the ones which are the ones that are going to get away, and you really need a dog to get in some bushes. One of the most vital roles Chris will play today is to spot or mark where the birds fall, something that all members of the shooting party should do. If there's one thing I could ask guns to do more is actually mark better and count how many birds I've got down. At the end of a drive, it, it's very difficult for us when we're actually looking very hard for a bird. If we don't know it's definitely there, then we may just gloss over it and go. If a gun says to us, yes, I've definitely got one, it's down there by that oak tree, hen bird, we know what we're looking for. We can go along there and we won't give up till we find it. However, a lot of, a lot of guns just shoot, get rather caught up in the actual action of shooting, which is fair enough. But really, if, you can, if you're killing birds, try and count them down, try and give, give a bit of an indication exactly where those birds are landing so we can then make a good job and actually make sure all the game which is shot on the day goes in the bag, not in a friendly fox at the e in the evening room. The dogs are busy going off after pricks, injured or dead birds. Many could be lost from the final bag if the dogs weren't able to chase down runners or pick up the scent of birds that have strayed or fallen out of view. That was an interesting example there because that bird had been hit by a gun who probably marked it down as being dead. He'd obviously marked it down and then looked away but I actually saw the bird running off. Now that bird would not have been picked because the gun would have gone to look where he shot it, realised it's not there and then hasn't got a clue where it's gone. Luckily, I was in position because we were far enough back behind the gun line to actually watch the birds coming down, mark them, and actually see if there's any prick birds running away. We are then able to work the dogs forward towards the guns, and then we don't miss the birds. If we're too close to the guns, the bird's behind you, and it's a lot harder for the birds behind you to start with. Always stand well back behind the guns and see what you can see exactly what's going on in front of you. Once the whistle goes, the dogs do a sweep and bring back bird after bird. Good lad. Their work ethic is admirable. I think that should be us done. Right, back to base and a very different discipline. Well, the importance of the dogs here is they've actually got a quest and provide birds for sport. So this is beating dogs. So the idea is they're questing for unshot game, looking for birds which as soon as they fly the dog's got to leave it because that bird will then go forward and become sport for the gun. The idea is these dogs do not catch these birds, these are unshot birds. This is the difference between picking up and beating. With a picking up dog they're generally looking for stuff which is wounded, which might be flapping, running away and they've got to know when, which is which, unshot and shot and that's the difficult bit of picking up. The beaters, Chris and the dogs make it look easy as they wade through the undergrowth. Thankfully the recent snow has made the brambles a little easier to cope with. This drive again throws up some good birds. On this beaters day they've been asked to shoot only cock birds. You want to make sure that you're up to the top because when we don't know these days there was Two of went across the and it looks as if they're doing what's been asked of them. They're being well looked after too. There is an open policy here. It's not just spaniels on this suit, you know. <laughs> With everyone safely on board, we're off to the top of the estate where James has a chance to ask Chris about the work that goes into training and looking after his dogs. Is it possible to have a dog that is a family pet and a working, working dog? Most definitely. Yeah, yeah most definitely. Um, again, you, you generally have a good rapport with a, with a family pet. Obviously, they spend a lot more time with you. 
Um, again, it's all down to basic training. You need the respect from your dog. And a lot of people who have, have them as a pet indoors most of the time still are able to take them out and work them on most shoots. In fact, I would say 90% are actually family pets of the working, picking up dogs. 90% still come in the house. I mean, I still have a few in my house. But generally, when they're working throughout the, throughout the winter, they're kenneled outside just because it keeps them fresh. Right, well, Chris, what are you looking for in the, in the ideal picking up dog? What are your characteristics? Well, the ideal picking up dog basically is a dog which can pretty much be stationary, watch the drive, take note of exactly what's going on, and actually on command go out and effect a retrieve on a bird, be that a runner or dead bird. We want the bird delivered back to hand as quickly as possible without well, a minimum of fuss, so it means getting the dog out to an area. It could be 100 yards, it could be 150 yards, it might only be 20 yards. If there's a wounded bird down, our aim is to get that bird back to our hand as soon as possible. So how do you, how do you feed the dogs in the, in the season as compared with the, the close season? Well, obviously, during the season, they're actually doing so much more work. I mean, my dog's generally out sort of four days a week, so therefore we actually have to up their food quite considerably. I always tend to add a bit of tripe. Um, I find it actually puts on good definition of muscle. It's very good for the dog's digestive system and it seems to give them conditions throughout the season. If you keep feeding the same food as you do through the summer, then you're going to struggle because the dog's not going to have the energy. You're saying a lot of your clients are women and uh, they, they've not had any previous experience of shoots. Um, it can be quite an intimidating place for them to come to, so how, how do you suggest they get over that? Yes, it is very, very intimidating. It's quite a male environment. Um, however, a lot of women are very good gun dog trainers and they just lack the nerve to actually approach a, a local shoot and actually ask to come along. Most shoots will really encourage women to come along and, and participate in, in this sort of sport. However, there are things which obviously women suffer with and that's toilet facilities. There are very poor toilet oh, facilities on any shoot. So as long as you're brave enough to be able to disappear behind a bush, if you're picking up, it's ideal because you're actually away from the guns, you're away from the most, most people, you can just disappear behind a bush and do your ablutions and get back on with the job. Um, if you approach a keeper with your best intentions, most keepers will allow you to come onto the ground. Dogging in is an excellent example. September, well, August, September and October, most shoots would welcome someone. As long as you've got a competent dog, isn't too wild, you can come onto the ground and actually dog in. Mm. It gets you a feel for the place, gets your dog used to flushing birds without chasing and being too wild. You can concentrate on your dog, you can control it. Um, there's not the added excitement of today when there's guns going off, lots of beaters, lots of other dogs running around. It's just you and your dog out, but you're actually on live game. Time for a spot of lunch, and at some point, a Canada goose makes an appearance. In 2008, this bird was listed in the UK as a pest species. This last drive has been billed as a good one and will ask a lot of the dogs. It involves pushing the birds through the wood and picking up as guns are walking with the beating line as well. As the dogs charge through the undergrowth, others take the track, including the gamekeeper's daughter, who looks just the part. The work rate of these dogs is just incredible. Their appetite for the chase and the retrieve is insatiable. Here we've got a wounded bird, was he shot in the wing only, so therefore we're going to have to dispatch it. One of the simplest ways is we always carry a stick, sharp top on the head. One of the biggest problems people have coming to the sport, wanting to work their dogs, is coping with dead or dying animals. Chris says a lot of training involves educating the owner as much as the dog. At the end of the day we're here to do a job and actually putting the bird out of its misery is the primary concern here. Birds have been wounded, far better that you should get it back, dispatch it as quick as we can, 
and we can all go on move on to the next bit. The bird's been wounded, so we've got to get it as soon as we can, dispatch it as soon as we can. It's only fair to the bird, really, and we all want the bird's welfare at the end of the day. We've got something nice to take home for the table at the end of it as well, so good job, well done. How do you deal with the people that are squeamish, though? It's just a case of getting over it, really. Some people prefer to wear gloves, and actually you'll soon find that actually you, you, you overcome it by actually fear, fear, feeling that this bird's injured. It's far better to actually put it out of its misery very quickly. A sharp tap on the back of the head solves that problem. Do you help people with that? Oh yes, yeah. I mean, we show people, they start off handing cold game, to say, to start with, and then move on to this. By, by the time they've got a dog to this stage, they're normally hardened enough to game that they're, they're prepared to do it, so, yeah. The birds keep coming and the dogs keep working. Having people like Chris on this suit makes good financial sense. Say each pheasant is worth £30. All it takes is for a single bird to be recovered and it pays for a beater or a picker-upper. If you then think that Chris and his dogs might retrieve maybe up to 50% of the birds today, that is a huge amount of money that the shoot might have lost. You can't underestimate the importance of the gum dog. It's obvious, we've just been spotting here, we've been taking birds off dogs, as my back's been turned, birds have been falling down, luckily my other dogs are marking them, fetching them in. If you didn't have dogs at all, we would hardly have any birds here because we'd be searching for one, taking a long time to find it. Meanwhile, other birds are being shot. In the melee of the excitement of the shoot, guns aren't marking down what they're shooting because it's so exciting. Birds are going to be lost. This way, hopefully, we pick up as many birds as we can. It's been a fantastic last drive. Lots of birds and lots of work for the dogs to do. As the whistle blows, we head out to the fields behind the line of guns. Some birds are marked and we know there are a few to be found. It's been a super day with a fantastic bag and a varied one. The dogs have worked their socks off and can hardly keep their eyes open. And you, uh, you say to the dogs before you see it yourself then? Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Once, I, once they're done, they can settle down, have a nice rest, because they will sleep from then on to the morning. And basically I can go in, I can have my bath, <laughs> and then my dinner. Last, last but not least. I think you'll sleep well as well, won't you? I think we will today, yeah, definitely. <laughs> So a hot meal and early bath for one and all. Couch burnt, didn't it? Yeah. Bye, mate. Yeah. Yeah.